Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Meanahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Today we're going to take a look at Fidelitas from Green Couch Games. Now this is a bit of a set collection game, the difference being that the sets that you're trying to gather are actually out in this general board called the city. You're trying to manipulate thematically, manipulate the different uh, guilds present in this sort of medieval fantasy type city, and you're, once you manipulate the guilds in such a certain way by putting different cards in different locations, you'll be able to score objective cards and give points. The first person to a certain amount of points is going to trigger the end of the game. It also ends if you go through the deck a couple of times. So there's a lot of special powers going around and trying to just manipulate things to serve your goals better than anyone else's. Let's go ahead and take a brief look at how the game is played, then we're going to come back and let you know what I think. All right, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of Fidelitas. This is a competitive game for up to four players. The goal of the game is to get the most points possible. And the game end is gonna be triggered in one of two different ways. Either when someone hits a certain threshold of points depending on the number of players. So for instance, for four players, it's six, six points. I believe for three players, it's eight points. When someone gets to that point total, you're gonna to finish out the round so that every player has an equal number of turns and then the game is going to end. Whoever has the most points at that point, which may or may not be the person who actually triggered the end of the game, is going to be the winner. The other way that the game is going to end is if you go through the Virtus deck, which are the main cards of the game, if you go through that deck twice, in other words, you've gone through the entire deck, you're forced to reshuffle, and then you have to do it again, then the game will immediately end. And whoever has the most points at that point is going to be the winner. That sounds funny to say, the most points at that point. Anyways, uh, at the beginning of the game, you're going to set up the game just like this. You have, whoops, I just destroyed the entire city. Uh, you have these five location cards with the castle and the docks at either end. So this is the general setup each time that you play the game. Each of these locations, except for the tavern, which is square in the center, is, well, first off, uh, note that there are two locations on each side of the card. So in other words, there's actually a total of 10 locations. Each of the four locations, aside from the tavern, is associated with one of the main guilds of the game, and the importance of the guilds will become clearer as I explain a little bit more about it. Then you're going to take uh, one card from the Virtus deck and put it next to every single location, so in other words, a total of 10 cards. And then each player is going to get two of the Virtus cards, which again are the same cards that have already been dealt out to the table, but you know, there's multiple different cards and guilds and such like that. And then you're gonna get two mission cards. So mission cards are secret goals that you're trying to achieve. Now on your turn, there's three different steps that you have to follow in order. The first thing that you must do is take a Virtus card from your hand and play it out to the city. The entire board, so to speak, is the city. And you need to take a Virtus card and play it on a specific location, one of the 10 locations. Now, if you place it on one of the, let's just call them the main locations, the, the four that are associated with one of the guilds, then you're gonna play the card so that it's on top of the stack so that every previous guild card, Virtus card that was played there, its guild symbol is still showing. And then you're gonna resolve the effect of the card. However, if you choose to play it on the tavern, you will ignore, it on either side of the tavern, I should say, you're going to ignore the effect of the card, and instead you get to take one of your mission cards that you have in hand, discard it, and then draw a new one to replace it. So the whole point of the tavern is simply to uh, swap out cards, uh, mission cards from your hand, although there's one other little thing I'll get back to in a second. Now, um, I'll explain what some of the cards do also in a minute. I just want to tell you how the basic game is played. Uh, once you get done playing a Virtus card, then the second part of your turn is to see whether or not you can accomplish one of your secret goals. All the secret goals, which I'll go back into a little more depth to in a second, are associated with how the board is laid out. So you're trying to get all the cards uh, laid out in a certain way that are beneficial to you meeting your goal. Whether it's having a certain number of guilds at the market or having a bunch of soldiers present in the city, this is the time of your turn and only on your turn that you can try and score those cards. And when you do so, you're simply gonna place them face up in front of you so that all the players can see. There's a point value on the bottom and that will tell you how close you are to actually ending the game and potentially winning the game. But you don't have to score any mission uh, 
Missio cards. I keep calling them mission cards, but any of the Missio cards, uh, you just may be able to. And finally, the third part of your turn is to draw cards. If you scored any of your Missio cards, you get to redraw until you have two in your hand. Same thing with the Virtus cards. In, in, because you played a Virtus card, you must draw unless you play one of the Virtus cards that says that has a symbol that says that you do not draw a card at the end of your turn. That's usually because those cards give you extra cards during your turn, so you don't draw another card to make up for that. The other exception to this is that instead of drawing from the Virtus deck, you can choose to take one of the face-up cards on either side of the tavern, either of the tavern locations. And the only exception to that is that if you had just played a, ta um, a Virtus card to one side of the tavern or a card was moved from the actions of another card to one side of the tavern, you have to take one from the opposite side of the tavern. I know that's a little bit wonky, but essentially you can either take from the deck or take from one or potentially both sides of the Virtus deck. Uh, the tavern, sorry. <laughs> Actually, let me interject myself because I just uh, realized that I forgot a very important rule that some people are probably already screaming about who are watching the video. When you play a Virtus card, if it belongs to one of the four main guilds, that card must go on to that guild spot. If it belongs to one of the other extraneous guilds that are not represented in the city, it can be played anywhere. With the exception of the tavern, any card can be played to the tavern regardless of the guild. So, for instance, if I had the merchant one of the merchant cards, it would have to go on one side of the merchant card. Now, if there's any kind of smart card special ability, that doesn't affect it. So if a card says, move two cards to another location, then it doesn't matter what the guild symbols are. You're, you're sort of breaking the rules and moving cards somewhere else, regardless of what their guild symbols are. But if you're actually playing the card, if it has um, guild familiarity with one of the four main locations, then you're going to have to put it in the appropriate spot. It also doesn't matter for the initial draw how the cards or the initial placement of the cards at the beginning of the game, how that matters either. Okay, now let me show you some of these Virtus cards in depth. All right, just to give you a few examples, here's the shopkeeper. When you play the shopkeeper, you swap one card with any other card in a different location. The priest, you can take an extra Misio card and draw a card, or you can draw two cards. And this is one of those cards that says that if you use this card, you are not going to be able to draw another card at the end of your turn because you're already drawing and are getting extra cards another way. The student, same thing. You get to draw four cards, choose one to add to your hand, and discard the three cards not chosen. The barrister, you take a card from any location into your hand. The Monk is an interesting card because you can score him like you would a Misio card if you meet the special conditions. So you can either take two cards from the Monk's location or score by revealing four other cards. Uh, the Broker, you can move two cards from one merchant location to, its, to two different locations or you can move two cards from two locations to one merchant location. The Thief, you can take a card from each player with more than two cards. The Butcher, remove any two cards to the discard pile. The Scribe, and this is the rarest guild in the game, move two cards from the Scribe's location to two other locations, or score by revealing a guild pair, and then you get to two victory points. The Swindler, the Swindler and all cards underneath may not leave unless cleared by soldiers. If alone, this card is inactive and subject to normal play. And speaking of the Soldier, the Soldier. If three Soldiers are present, clear the location, which means you get rid of all the character cards. Otherwise, move one card from the Soldier's location to any other location. Now let's take a look at the Misio cards. So these feature the same artwork as the Virtus cards, which can sometimes be confusing, but it's, they're really different cards. These are only for scoring purposes. So the Swindler here, gain the trust of the Swindler. You gather a guild pair in three locations. So if you have three different locations with a pair of people from the same guild, you can score that card during your scoring phase. Uh, hold sway over the military guild. Eight soldiers must be present anywhere in the city. Gain the trust of the Thief. Four locations must be empty. Gain the trust of the Broker. Gather characters from four different guilds at the Warehouse location specifically. Gain the trust of the Scribe. Two cards from the Purple Guild must be present in the city, which is harder than it sounds. And finally, uh, remember there's more, a lot more of these, so I'm just showing you some of them. Gain the trust of the city. At least one card from each of the nine guilds must be present in the city, and you'll score those points. And that's really it. That's just a very general, broad overview of Fidelitas. You're trying to score as many points as possible, potentially be the person that ends the game, and then hopefully be the person who wins the game. Let's get to my final thoughts. 
Fidelitas is pretty interesting to me because it feels much more like a board game than just a card game, which is surprising when you first open the box and just see a couple of stacks of cards. But the way that you manipulate all the different factions, the guild cards around, the Virtus cards, I should call them, and move them around to the different locations, and how certain uh, cards only affect people in certain locations. In fact, there are cards that only affect people near the castles or the docks. How all of that works together and how you can manipulate all of that is really interesting because it sort of raises it just a step above a typical card game. Having said that, it, it is definitely a, a hand management game, trying to figure out the best cards to keep in your hand and to play at the right moment, deciding whether or not your goals are suitable at that time or whether you should dump them and spend an action in order to do so is really the key to winning the game. Uh, as always, I love it when there are cards that have tons of different powers, and there's tons of different guild cards in this game that all do different things, um, and varying different special effects, all useful at certain times. Scoring the mission cards is also interesting as well, and deciding when something is just not going to work out for you, and you should probably get rid of it and move on to something else, or when you should try your best, wait, hope that you draw the right cards, and make sure that um, you can you actually score those cards before anyone else can, because it is a bit of a racing game trying to get to that point threshold. I have yet to see a game of this end from the deck running out two times. It seems much less likely, although I haven't played the game with two players, maybe it's more likely in that scenario. Uh, it is interesting how you can go to the tavern, and uh, that is the main way that you're going to be getting rid of your missions and getting new ones if you want to do so, but also that you can take uh, Virtus cards from there as your draw at the end of the turn, although you can't do it if it's from one side of the tavern if you just played a card there or moved a card there. So there is some forward thinking and strategy involved, and there is a surprising amount of strategy to the game and how you play things out. A couple of the issues that I have with the game, first off, going back to the whole thing about swapping out missions, it is very possible that you get stuck with missions that are just not going to happen. Or perhaps they will be able to happen, you're like, yes, I'm on my way, I'm setting things up, and then by the time it gets all the way back around to you, the state of the game has changed drastically. Some of the Virtus cards are very powerful, which can be fun, but it can also mean it can totally foil all of your plans. That is a little bit of the interaction that's in the game that can be interesting, it can also be very, very frustrating. Like, for instance, just as one example, I was trying to score um, a card that let this required me to have four empty spaces on the board, which was a surprisingly monumental feat for only giving me two points. Now, of course, it's not monumental if by luck and chance it just happens to work out that way, but all the other players are inadvertently working towards that goal as well by moving things in a certain way, and you just capitalize on that and are able to score it. But if things don't work out that way, it just becomes almost impossible to score, and you have to move on. But of course, in order to move on, you have to use an action. I will go ahead and say waste an action just to swap out that card and get a new one, which you may also not be able to score as easily. So, games that I've seen, I've played this with four and three players, there's been a couple of players that are within reach of each other, but then a couple of players who were just completely blown out. They never had any type of shot. You can say that that's because they, were, they weren't skilled, they weren't very familiar with the game, but sometimes they just did not have a goal that they were going to be able to complete, and that can be kind of frustrating. I'll also say that the rule book is pretty awful here. Now, granted, this is a very simple game. It was very easy for us to get into it and start playing, but many of the card's rules were not evidently clear just from reading the card. I spent a lot of time going going to Board Game Geek's forums, looking for notes from the designers and publishers about how certain cards were actually supposed to interact, and some things are still not entirely clear. I just wish that they had been worded a bit better. I mean, there's plenty of room on the card. They could have done that. I did. The game looks fantastic, I'll say that, but of course, some of that space could have been sacrificed uh, that's otherwise used for art to actually put more text on the card and to clearly state what some of these different things do and how they interact with each other. In fact, scoring uh, the Virtus cards that can be scored are probably the most complicated thing, and even that is not totally clear in the rule book, although I assume that we did it correctly. So things like that were kind of frustrating and I wish were a bit clearer, especially for such a simple game. Nevertheless, I found it very interesting, the interaction of the cards and how you're moving things around the city, trying to get things back into your favor. It looks great, but I love the artwork on the cards. Um, there's no theme to it per se, so it's tough to say that it has a great theme, but it looks great and I like the idea of manipulating these different guilds. If you can get past the rule book, if you can get past kind of the, the funky way that missions come into your hand, and may or may not be able to be scored or kind of uneven point values there for the difficulty involved in scoring them. If you can get past those things, it's a pretty interesting and solid card game and one that I like quite a bit. That is Fidelitas from Green Couch Games. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. 
and make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.